before I begin this talk, I want to say that the most recent two and a half years of open source, I think the most, the most recent three years of open source comes to campus out of a five year history, uh, have had the amazing involvement of Sean and Gordon McKeon, who's around the conference, who's giving another talk in this room uh, just the time period after this. She's talking with Albert, Alberto Roca in a talk called Catalyzing Diversity. And if you can make it, I really encourage you to. Uh, she just stepped down gracefully from her former role as program director at Open Hatch, and I'll tell you more about that in this talk. Um, also, so these open source comes to campus events are volunteer run events that teach people how to get involved in open source. Have any people here volunteered at one? Can you raise your hands? Wow, cool. Oh, you did, well you were at one in Baltimore. <laughs> okay, did. great. So uh, that's pretty great. Uh, thank you all for doing that. So uh, I'm gonna try to leave you with three key lessons about open source comes to campus that sort of define it. And then I'll give you more resources to understand it in greater depth afterwards. You can talk with more more afterwards too. Uh, so first of all, open source comes to campus exists to grow the open source community. Uh, that is why I made it. Uh, secondly, I discovered over running it that organization is required, and I'll explain more about what that means. And the third is that our events keep getting better over time. So I hope that you can remember these things and then tell them to other people when they ask, oh, how was that talk by Ashish? You're like, well, there were three things. <laughs> Hopefully pretty memorable. So, and I'll repeat them at the end too. So you'll hear, the best way to explain all this stuff, I think, is for me to tell a lot of stories. So I'm gonna do that. Uh, and I hope that you all can take some of these lessons and apply them to your own projects hopefully related to open source and diversity outreach of your own. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is why I decided, why I cared about running something like Open Source Comes to Campus in the first place. Uh, so how many of you went to college? Keep your hands up if you did, great. Uh, how many of you say, keep your hands up what, if you were in college and you did anything relating to open source, like uh, using open source software when it was uncommon among your peers or running mailing lists for your peers or uh, filing bugs or reading mailing list traffic on other open source projects, cool. So now of you, uh, how many felt like enough of your peers were doing that too and you were totally satisfied with the community you had at your college? So I know I wasn't. I'm glad you almost were. Um, <laughs> and I'm glad you were. Um, and I felt kind of lonely caring about software politics while I was at Hopkins. And that was sort of the a feeling that I had that was catalyzed by some events you'll hear about, about Open Source Comes to Campus. So here is how it began. Uh, in 2010, there were two people, me and Rafael Krutlandau, working at Open Hatch, along with Parker Finney, who is in the red jacket here. He was an intern. Uh, this is us in Philadelphia in the winter. Um, Open Hatch at this point was what I call Open Hatch version one, the startup. Uh, we had gotten some incubator money from a startup funding program in Atlanta that wanted to be a Y Combinator clone. They invested in us, it didn't work out, we didn't make millions of dollars for anyone. Um, but uh, we, our goal was to try to make a community website around open source, get other contributors, to get contributors to use that to find new contributors, and somehow use this to make money off of the nice people who are also using the site. Uh, eventually we gave up on that latter bit. But, um, uh, so it was me at, in, at this point Rafi on the, the blue jacket and Parker here. Um, there are two other people I have to mention if I'm talking about Open Hatch version one, the startup. One is this fellow, Nelson Pavlovsky. He's wearing the same t-shirt I am in this photo. Uh, this is the t-shirt for this org student organization called Students for Free Culture, which he co-founded, and that's how I know him from 2003, four era. Um, he's the one whose idea it was to do a startup in the first place, so without him, none of this would have happened. Uh, and he was with us at the beginning in Atlanta. He left by the time we got to Philadelphia. We also were working with an intern named Karen Rustad Tulva, who you see pictured here. Uh, among other important facts, she's the one who drew Sufjan, the open hatch mascot. Uh, Why is he named Sufjan? He's named Sufjan because... Uh, you can't even put on a slide. I know. <laughs> is that adorable? Because that's how cuteness works? I thought smaller things were cuter. Um, so, technical reasons that I'll get to you five times. All right, okay, um, So, as 2010 went on, uh, it was pretty clear that we weren't running a successful startup. 
And uh, we were in Philadelphia, and we thought, well, we might as well meet some people who care about open source outreach. So we went to this gloriously cheap, rundown Indian restaurant uh, for, uh, where I organized the meetup. This restaurant isn't quite a restaurant. It's really a grocery store with a cafeteria in the back. Uh, <laughs> have you been to it? Or just know the scene? I mean, it's yeah. Like yeah. And here I ran this meetup, and I think about six ish people who also cared about open source and outreach came by, and one of them was named Lily Lambda. And Lily explained she works at a lab at Penn, and she's talking with other undergrads who might work at the lab with her, and she says, these, these people, these, this, my prospective lab mates, they can't compile code from scratch. They don't know how to participate in open source projects. They don't know even how to get help on their own projects by joining IRC channels. She, you've got to come by and run like an uh, evening, hour-long session or something to teach them about open source. And I said, well, if I give a talk, there might not be enough time for them to actually learn a lot. So maybe we could run a weekend-long workshop. And Lily was like, sure, OK. <laughs> so then uh, Lily, Felice, and I, who is a friend of Lily's, Lily's at the time, Felice Ford, uh, found ourselves responsible for the first Open Source Comes to Campus event. And this is what it looked like. So we did actually make it. Uh, this was a couple months later in September 2010. And that's why the timer says five years, 1,000 students. Uh, this is what it looks like, and I'll tell you a bit about how this event works worked over the next five, ten minutes, because the things that did and didn't work about this event sort of set the stage for the problems we have to fix and the things that do work about all the following events. So we, this, for this event, we had a two-day schedule, because we figured uh, there's enough to teach people on the first day, so we can give them some tutorials, then they can come back and have a full day to hack on open source project. Um, and we figured they could rotate between little small group teaching modules. And the four modules we picked were one about communication tools and open source projects, one about how to get and build open source code, one about how projects are organized and how version control works, and one about the command line. Uh, the structure was that students you know, would uh, stay, teachers would, well, uh, we emailed teachers to tell them that which one of these they would teach, and then students <coughs> would rotate between the teacher groups. So this results in a logistical problem at the event, where if every hour, like eight students had to get up and wander to the next teacher, well, one of them is still talking to the teacher, so the other eight inbound students don't want to sit down because there isn't space yet, and they have to all plug their laptops back in, and it's an enormous logistical problem, so don't do that. We learned that. Uh, we also ran into a problem where students' computers were set up inconsistently, which is a standard problem that plagues every uh, bottom-up teaching tech event. Sorry, I eventually learned this. Learned this. Um, I had to face this problem once. Um, we lost a bunch of time to computer setup anyway. Uh, another problem that I didn't expect was that the teaching modules had sort of intertopic dependencies, which I could have thought about. Um, so if you find yourself at the Linux command line session at the beginning of the morning, um, and you're teaching some students, uh, you will have to fill them in on a lot of things, very basic things for the command line, like ls and cd. But then by the end of the day, students have come to you having gone through the getting and building the code thing. So they probably learned some command line there. So whatever you figured out how to teach in the beginning of the day no longer applies, it's all very confusing. Uh, so those are the intertopic dependencies. The other problem was that Instructors actually didn't prep very well, myself included. So there were, uh, we emailed them, right? We said, here's the things that you'll have to teach. Uh, look forward to seeing you. What more do they need? They know everything now of how to prepare. And in some theoretical way, they know everything of how to prepare. That doesn't mean they will. Um, so like, and also, they're not used to teaching necessarily. So John Stumpo and I had to teach students how diffing and patching work um, and we realized that students don't have a concept of software projects as things that evolve. They make a thing for a homework assignment, then they make the next thing for a homework assignment. What is this diff thing? Um, so, you know, we figured out how to blend that in. And we got faster and faster and better and better at teaching this because we had four tries to rehearse it. And so by the last one, we could do all this in half an hour, which then leaves this other problem of what do you do with half an hour of spare time? Uh, but those are sort of the problems. I want to pause here at this blank slide and tell you that we're going to talk about some good things that happened too. So 
Uh, one thing that really impressed me, so Felice Ford decided for the Windows users, somewhere on this board it's written, uh, Windows user, we can help you set up Linux without destroying your Windows install. And honestly, the like three students who decided to install Ubuntu that morning, like got there at 11, finished their laptop setup by 11.30, and then had Ubuntu installs working. That blew me away. Um, another thing that worked pretty well was our gender diversity at the event. So uh, this is a part of diversity in open source that matters a lot to me. And uh, we had about, <laughs> I love this picture because it's like, whatever, the guys drink coffee and don't do anything real, the girl thing. <laughs> um, I mean, you can, you can say, you can prove anything with a momentary snapshot of a room. Um, anyway, so about 30% of our students were women at this event, and about 30% of the applicants to the event were women. So we, uh, we said we can hold about 20 people, and then 51 people emailed us, so we had to figure out who to accept. And we just sort of sorted by the most excited, and then picked the top 30 most excited, and... <laughs> I, like that. I like that scale. Yeah. How excited are you? I mean, with the other 21 people, they probably wouldn't get as much out of it. So great, um, and and similarly in the top 30 most excited it was about 10 young women also, um, and I think we achieved that by two things. One is that we had a diverse applicant pool. So uh, there's a funny thing to say about a computer science program because it's worth illuminating. Penn actually has two computer science programs. They have a computer science program called Computer Science, and they have a different computer science program called Digital Media Design, which is the computer science program, and also you take some design classes. Uh, the digital media design program has, I think, 50-ish percent women, and the Penn CS program has 20-ish percent. And I didn't re understand any of this detail when we were sending out the blasts, but uh, our emails went to this whole collection of people, so we had a pretty diverse applicant pool. Uh, the other is that the information on the website about the event was pretty inviting. It said, welcome newcomers. If you want to learn more, come to this event. You don't have to know things. You don't have to have any experience. Really, uh, it's for you. And people believed us, I think. So uh, I did the best I could to express that. The other thing that I took away from running this was that people actually want this event. So like, people decided to spend a weekend with us that they could have spent any other way. We were above capacity. We had to pick who could attend. Uh, and so I want to read to you some of the things that students said to us. Uh, after the event to give you a sense of what it meant to students. One person said uh, they learned you don't have to be a pro programmer to contribute anything, to help or contribute something. Sorry. Uh, another one said after the, there, there is a, we had a topic in this event on uh, the ethics and history of free software. And after that one, one student said free software ethics puts everything in a different perspective. So like there are people who want to receive this message who I guess hadn't yet. And another one said, it was good to learn that open source people aren't cyborgs. So the invitingness was working, I think. Um, the were one bit of negative feedback, oh yeah? Were they disappointed to learn that? Oh, I think they were excited too. Okay. Um, uh, but there was one student who was disappointed uh, by us using the word hack and hackers all over the place. And she said it felt really, it felt not really, really, but slightly uh, like exclusive. Um, and, but it was a distraction, and like, uh, yeah. So from that, I took the idea that I just should avoid it if possible. Um, so in later events, I call this project time or project night, and I've just tried to stop using the word hack to describe things to people who aren't sort of already in the fold. Um, so that was the Saturday part, the teaching part. The second day, we were, people were supposed to contribute to open source projects. So this is Zach Goldberg. Uh, showing people something. And for me, the real point of this event was this second day. I wanted, I was thinking in a very like goal-oriented way, we need to get more open source contributors. So we're gonna do that by teaching them and then having them submit some patches. And uh, my strategy here was we would gather some supposedly bite-sized bugs in a variety of open source projects. I would stand at the front of the room and read this list and then give it to people as an Etherpad link. And then people would, I don't know, group together like this and start hacking on things. Uh, it didn't quite work out that way for about three reasons. So uh, 
yeah. Uh, one is that if you're standing at the front of the room reading a list of like bugs and Linux desktop apps to people, even if like some of them are easy and documentation issues, there's a motivation problem here. If you're a Mac user, you know nothing about GNOME Terminal and why it's important to fix this help issue so that it displays properly with the new version of Yelp or whatever. Um, it might be a useful learning example, but it's not motivating to people by itself. Another problem, which I imagine some of you have run into in your other lives, is that compiling stuff is hard. Uh, it often doesn't work. I actually kind of forget this because I'm a Debian developer, and the whole point of Debian is to make compiling things actually work. Um, but yeah, not everyone else is a Debian developer. So one student actually managed to find a bug she cared about, which was in some Sugar Lab software. She had seen a talk by Walter Bender about one laptop per child, and uh, she was getting a virtual box, using virtual box to set up a Sugar development environment and had some problem. We eventually got her past that. Uh, but the other problem that we ran into at the end is how to manage community. So community, to me, is the thing that makes open source hackathons supposedly different from startup-y hackathons. It's the idea that uh, people are working on something together. There's a sense of humility that I really like, where you know that you need other people's work, and if you're trying to achieve something, you're not going to get there any faster by insulting their work. And uh, you know that if you're making new open source software, you need to be humble enough to share that code, and you're going to get some feedback, and that'll be life. Um, so these are some things that really matter to me, and so the community aspect does really matter to me. Uh, and I don't think that we help people make the leap from learning to actually connecting with a community. Um, but on the bright side, I'm reminded of a lesson in this ice cream recipe book by Ben and Jerry's. I used to use this a bunch as a kid, and there's a line in there that says, there's no such thing as an unredeemably bad batch of homemade ice cream. And maybe similarly, there's no such thing as an unredeemably bad homemade open source outreach event. Like people showed up, we tried some things, they had a reasonably good time based on what they said. I was stressed out when they couldn't compile stuff, but they somehow figured out things anyway. Uh, their lives are not ruined. Um, but I, it was pretty clear that we needed some more organization. So I mean this, that we needed organization, lesson two, in two senses. One is that we could have prepped way better for this event, and the event would have gone better. But the other way is that if we wanted to run many more events like this, then we're going to need staff so that we can pay people to do the things that volunteers aren't going to be able to do. Uh, and even if that's sort of merely helping volunteers do things that volunteers are good at, there's going to be such things. And if there's going to be people other than the founders doing it, then we're definitely going to have to pay them. So I figured we should make a nonprofit around this, um, which uh, seemed like a nice answer to my question uh, in my mind around September 2010 of what am I going to do with this failed startup that did some useful things but doesn't exist really anymore. Uh, so, so I figured, OK, I'm going to uh, save up from my part-time programming job. I'm going to live on $30,000 a year from July of 2011 to July 2012. And I'm going to travel around the world running these Open Source Comes to Campus events. Uh, I'd already lived on that much in Philadelphia. And Somerville, where I lived at the time, wasn't much more expensive. Um, there's a few problems with this plan. Uh, one of them is that July means there's no college students around, actually. So that's a kind of poor timing uh, to start spending this. The other is that, uh, well, the other is that if I'm going to be going to all these events, it's, really, it's going to take a lot of work. Um, so in 2011, I managed to work with Jessica McKellar to run one event over the whole course of the year. Uh, that's all I managed to achieve. That's slightly underselling it. Uh, I also uh, took a bit of a detour to learn about how to run better community events. I uh, started this thing with Jessica called the Boston Python Workshop for Women and Their Friends. I gave a talk about it at PyCon here. Uh, it ended up inspiring PyLadies to start, and so Danny Greenfield calls me the godfather of PyLadies, which is kind of cool. But uh, it didn't help me. It wasn't an open source comes to campus event, though. It was kind of a distraction. Uh, I did learn some things. Um, but the other thing that I was trying to do was to start and fund a nonprofit. So if you're ever finding, if you ever find yourself in that situation, I think Bradley would say, stop, don't do it, <laughs> and become a conservancy project instead, but uh, depending on the project. But, um, 
if you find yourself in the situation of wanting to start and fund a nonprofit, then I mega recommend this book by Nolo Press. Great. Um, it tells you how to form a nonprofit corporation. And it turns out forming a nonprofit is a constrained writing exercise. Did you Irish Probably. I was going to ask <laughs> if you did. I recall, I recall Thank you. sending you that book over. Great. Um, and I read it, and I was like, great. Are you like, uh, the IRS has some like form 10, 1023 that needs you to say some of these things in this way, and then they'll believe that you're a charity. Also, you can't use it as a tax shelter. Also, you should probably have a lawyer read your documents before you send it to them. Fine, great, we did that. Uh, also, you need a board. Okay, so I found Mike Links there, who I knew from Creative Commons, Deb Nicholson, who I knew from Free Software Foundation and related outreach stuff in Boston, Karen Rustad, Pilva, who you saw before, who designed Sufjan, and Jessica McKellar, with whom I worked on the Boston Python workshop. And now we had a board, great. So the other thing we needed to do was fundraise for this thing. Uh, and I spent the rest of 2011, in addition to only running one open source come to the campus event, kind of having no idea how to fundraise for it. Uh, also, I, uh, in the beginning of 2012, decided to move to San Francisco, which is you know almost as cheap as Somerville, right? <laughs> uh, uh, there was a girl involved. The girl thing didn't work out, but we're still friends. Uh, anyway, I lived in San Francisco before, um, so I wasn't. I knew that if this didn't work out, that I wasn't going to be stranded. Uh, this is a beautiful photo of San Francisco taken from. Actually, does anybody know where this? Has anybody been here? So okay, so I recommend you all go here because this is a photo from the Google SF office. Uh, find a friend who works not in the Mountain View office but in the Google office, uh, like Cat Ullman, who some of you probably know. Uh, I used this photo to illustrate San Francisco because Kat uh, was the first person with the Open Source Programs Office, first organization, to say, this Open Hatch thing sounds cool. We'd like to give you money. Send, you, send, send us an invoice. And I was like, great. Do we need our full nonprofit status yet? She was like, no, we don't care about that. <laughs> like, oh, great, OK. So then we got some money, and it was pretty great. Uh, and eventually, we raised enough to hire me uh, in this time period to be executive director. And over the course of 2012, I helped run some more events, but I could also tell that fundraising was a really stressful thing to do, and running events was also a very stressful thing to do, and the two added up were exceeding my capacity for stress. So I asked some friends what I should do, and one of them said, you should talk to Shauna Gordon McKeon. So I, when I was visiting Boston one time, I said, hey, why don't you come volunteer at this event at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. You'll get to understand the curriculum. You'll see how it, what it means to students. We can pay for your travel. And if I can actually fundraise, then we can hire you later. And she was like, OK. So here's her with one of the other students at UIC. Um, that was the fourth event we ran in 2012. Um, and I was getting slightly better at asking people for money. So uh, we eventually did manage to hire her <coughs> part time. And uh, I'll, this is another person. So Shauna is one of the two actually organized people who I met early on in the history of Open Hatch. Uh, I'm not. Uh, this is the other one, Jessica McKellar. And I gave a talk with her at PyCon in 2012 about the Boston Python workshop stuff that we did. Um, so in that year, we managed to run four events, which was more than we had run in the whole history of Open Hatch so far. Um, and I also feel like four events is almost impressive. I don't think it really quite is, though. But anyway, um, we luckily, this happened. Shauna joined us. And her most recent title, up until she left a month or so ago, was program director. Uh, after 2012, I sort of took a back seat in event running. And Shauna was the one communicating with event organizers and training them and going to events physically, mostly. And I was sort of mostly helping fundraise and uh, connecting her with mentors so that the events could have a good student-teacher ratio. Um, and the rest of this talk, basically, is Shauna's accomplishments. So I just want to make sure you all know that I'm very grateful for the amazing work that she's did. And without her work, we would not have organization in definition one being uh, well prepared for things, disciplined. So that's uh, now hopefully you know why we, started, why we started Open Source Comes to Campus and what I mean by we need organization. Uh, now I'm going to try to tell you about how the events have kept getting better over the years. So uh, one of the ways in which they got better in 2013 was that there were simply more of them. So to me, this is a real success because it means that we're reaching more people. Uh, in 2013, under Shauna's helm, we reached 
more than twice as many of these as, we reached twice as many as we'd done in the whole pass. Um, that just blew my mind. Um, and in addition, the quality was getting better too, not just the quantity. Uh, so, Sumana Harihareswara told me to run a train the trainers event at Open Source Bridge two years ago. Were any of you there? Okay. Um, yeah, anyway, for some reason the conference organizers accepted this, which meant that I had to do some so called conference driven development where I needed to make sure that our instructor material actually was comprehensible by a new volunteer. Um, which was a good thing to have to do. As I recall, I stayed up really late on the night before the conference and chatted a lot with Shauna and figured out what we should change and what we should keep and sanity checking things. Uh, and also at this talk, I believe I forgot to thank Shauna. So I want to sort of retroactively thank her, if that's possible. So I was sort of hoping some of you were there, but if not, that's fine. I'll go find those people, hopefully, uh, and tell them. Uh, but the other thing we did in 2013 was in running 12 events, you sort of learn by doing. Uh, you see a lot of events and you know, oh, this specific thing doesn't work, or this specific thing does, and I'll tell you about one of those. So in 2013, we had an event at Wellesley College in Massachusetts, and this fellow, Paul Tagliamonte, is demoing Git, and he, during this demo, managed to mess up his Git repository and have be in this totally stressed out state in front of the lectern, and the students are loving it. Not because they're masochists, but because it means that you don't have to be perfect to do these things. When they have the same problems, they're going to, they're sort of pretty forgiven. So that's something that we'd like to integrate more into our teaching, having seen this. Uh, and you can see the students, like at the rest of the event, are having a pretty good time. Uh, we also, Shauna and I also did what I call the Open Hatch Midwest Tour where we went to uh, Indiana University at Bloomington and Purdue and University of Illinois at Chicago and University of Minnesota at Morris. And at the end of doing two weeks of sort of four events almost back to back, um, we, well, during this process, we were just repeatedly confronted with curriculum problems. And I'll talk about how we fixed those. We were also grateful for friends of ours who were willing to help us address those problems ourselves. So some of you might know Mel Chua. She was, uh, came to the Purdue event and told us to all go to this coffee shop in uh, West Lafayette, Indiana, and sat us down and was like, so teaching. I actually study this stuff. <laughs> she was a lot nicer than that. Um, <laughs> uh, and she sort of pointed at two specific things we could do differently. The first is we could cut what's not needed, and then we could have more time to teach better what is needed. And the other is that she told me, so up until this point, so students uh, through this workshop, they're doing exercises. They're like uh, typing git things or typing command line things and, uh, or they're trying to compile open source projects or so on. And I figured I was empathetic enough to be able to look around the room and see who was stuck in addition to people whose hands were up because hands sort of through gravity go down. And, uh, Mel said, did you notice these other students in the front row who you never got to? And I was like, no. So clearly, I wasn't actually as good at figuring out who was stuck as I thought I was. So we needed to fix that somehow. Um, and talking with her caused us to do a couple of curriculum changes. Uh, one was, one is about how to teach bug trackers to students. So mo most students in college have never seen a bug tracker, at least in our experience. Um, and if you think about it, this makes a lot of sense. Like, why would they? They use like pre-compiled, polished software that uh, doesn't have a way to get involved. And even if it does, it's not clear what this collection of bug thing is. Um, so, so I really want students to come away from the events learning how to read bug tracker issues. And uh, Mel suggested the strategy that she calls think pair share, where you have somebody privately think about something for five minutes. You have them pair up with someone who is thinking about a slightly different thing for five minutes, and then for five minutes you do Q&A, the instructor in the audience will be like, what did you all see? And that way people have time to think to themselves rather than sort of have their thinking be out-competed by the person talking next to them. Um, so we made a new exercise for bug trackers where students read a bug, they pair up with a student who read a different bug, 
and then they talk about the crazy thing they saw. So I'm going to show you like, one of the crazy things they see. Can anyone tell me what the bug is here? This is the birthday picker in the Android, uh, in Android, I think 4.1.0 contacts in US English. Yeah, what's the bug? December, December is missing. Uh, you show this to students, and they're like, how is this real? And the answer is an off by one error. And then, <laughs> uh, and you get to watch in this long bug thread about how like Android 4.1.0 was released, and then it had this bug, and some random person uh, filed it and took a screenshot. Um, and so it demonstrates not just reading the bugs, but also the community aspect too. Um, and you can do that pretty quickly if you're asking people to really do something. Um, the other bug is an issue in Ubuntu where if you have a brother brand printer, and you're printing using openoffice.org, for certain versions of Ubuntu, it will not print on Tuesday. <laughs> and the bug is phenomenal because people the next day are like, oh, I must have upgraded something at work now. But they're back six days later. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing, the other curriculum piece that we changed is uh, we changed how we teach Git, we changed how we teach Git to involve GitHub. So uh, what we do is we have students Originally, we had students on their own clone a Git repo, make a Git, make a Git format patch against it, submit that to an automated grading tool, kind of, and have that automated grading tool be like, hooray, we merged your patch. Um, and I felt like, great, this allows them to demonstrate the tools, allows them to perceive the uh, whole context of Git. But we now do it a very different way, which is we give students, oh, yeah, we give students this website. And we tell them, uh, you and your small group are going to fix some bugs. So Shauna wrote a buggy piece of JavaScript here, intentionally buggy, that as you click this poem, it eventually crashes. Um, there, that's one of the bugs. Also, you could change the definition of fork to an actual definition of fork. We give students in small groups a Git repo uh, with some of these, with these bugs pre-filed. And so each one teacher and seven students or so has a website they're all working on. That's why this is CCSF-5. Um, and so you break everyone into small groups, and suddenly they have a thing to do, and they have to figure out how to use Git to do it. And uh, they end up making, I think, really nice websites, uh, like this one, which answers the question about what forking is uh, somewhere on there. Or uh, the C City College of San Francisco students made this one. Like, look at that. So um, that's open source. Anyway, I don't know. But it, it causes them to be motivated to actually use Git in a context where it makes sense. And I could tell this was working because students asked so much better questions. Uh, eventually, they started submitting pull requests, and the instructor hadn't merged one. And so they wanted to work on a different issue. They started working on it. They submitted a new pull request. And they were like, hey, how do I get these pull requests to have different contents? Because I know that. The work I did for this one is unrelated to the work I did for that one. And I was like, finally, someone wants to learn about Git filter branch. <laughs> Which you don't get normally. <laughs> um, great. So, uh, so that's new since 2013. Uh, we figured that out by confronting ourselves with the bad curriculum, the could be improved curriculum, and figuring out how to improve it, and then testing it. Uh, the other thing that happened in 2013 is we started to learn by other people doing. So the last event of 2013 was at Princeton, organized with the Princeton Women in CS group. This is what it looked like. Interestingly, neither Shauna nor I were physically at the event. Sumina was. Sumina took our material, chatted a lot with Shauna, I'm sure, and ran an event entirely without us, which demonstrated that the work we'd done in 2013 to make the documentation work for people was basically good enough. I mean, Sumina's very experienced, so she could deal with gaps if you needed to, but it means that it's possible at all. Um, this was also an important moment for me because the end of 2013 is when I decided that I would be done being executive director. I would sort of take a vacation from free software activism and be bathed in money, technical challenge, and coworkers by working with Philip, who just joined us here, at Eventbrite uh, as a security engineer. So other people doing things became extra important to me at that time. Uh, I was still, I still am, and I became uh, merely the volunteer president, and I was still Shauna's boss. Uh, it was just a volunteer job. Um, we, 
Uh, another thing that we did over time is we replaced the large group lecture by me talking about the history and ethics of free software with small group Q&A where students just ask whatever questions they want in a so-called career panel of mentors in a very small group and then the mentors rotate every 15-ish minutes. And that way I can still indoctrinate people but in addition we're talking in small groups and when you do that like the room just becomes so noisy and that's how you know it's working. Everyone is talking, it's really great. So yeah, so we replaced the career panel which we used to do in a large group way with this small group chat thing. Um, the main thing we did in 2014 then was we tried harder to not go anywhere. So uh, the innovation here was to avoid travel, uh, get people like Sumina or other people like her to run these events uh, with Shauna's remote help and we figured the material for teaching the events was basically well tested enough and we did make ourselves available in cases of emergency. So uh, Shauna was an IRC, I was available by phone. I think basically though, if you're running an event, like there are two kinds of emergencies you can have. You can have a curriculum emergency, in which case you kind of don't have time to have us fix it for you, or you can have a logistics emergency, in which case we can't help at all. So we didn't really get much contact with the emergencies. Um, there is one thing I'll have us do, uh, which is, in, so in 2014, we managed, we meaning Shauna really, managed to run 26 events this way. And that's how you get to 1,000 students, by doubling every year, which I, still blows me away. Uh, so I want to do something that'll take a moment, but I think is worth it. Um, I want to read off the names of those colleges and have you clap at the end of each college once, like, I'll say like, Harvard, and you'll say, great. Uh, and then at the end of it, actually applaud, please, for the work that Shauna did. <laughs> so uh, the University of Arizona, UMass Amherst, City College of San Francisco, George Mason University, SUNY Stony Brook, Northeastern Illinois University, MIT, Hartnell College, UC Davis, U Minnesota Morris, City College of San Francisco, Bucknell, DePaul, Claremont, University of Victoria, Hartnell College, IU Bloomington, Swarthmore, Columbia University, Cornell, University of Washington, UC Berkeley, SUNY Baruch, SUNY Stony Brook, Perth Scholas, and Princeton University. So that's what we, meaning she, was able to do. Uh, and I want to talk a bit more about some of the ways that we, some of the things that we've done well, I think. Uh, so I talked a bit about diversity in the beginning, about gender diversity in particular. Um, one of our early events at Rensselaer Polytechnic, um, I, I was showing Karen Rustad the photos, and she was like, how come this event looks so much more doodly than the other ones? What did you guys do wrong? Uh, this is back in 2010, I think. And I looked things up, and I talked with Alex Gaynor, who was our host at RPI. Um, our statistics for gender diversity at that event were 22% women, which looked much less than our pen event. Um, but RPI's CS program is actually only 9% women. So we were still way above the pool, which suggests that to, to some extent, yeah, five minutes, thank you. Um, to some extent, interest in this event is more skews in favor of demographics that aren't already involved, which is fascinating. Uh, Shauna really, the other thing to say here is that if you want to have more impact in some specific aspect of diversity, it's easy, just rig your applicant pool. So organize it with a women in CS group or go to Wellesley College and you'll only have women there. And you're improving the world in the way you wanted to, which is, if you did, gender diversity and open source. That was our primary tactic in 2013 and I was pretty happy with it. Uh, the other thing that Shauna told me about diversity though is we could do better at considering other kinds of diversity. For example, socioeconomic diversity. Uh, one of the places that we've gone recently that Shauna physically went to, I think, recently, is Perskolis, which is a free IT college in the Bronx. Uh, you, there's many more state schools in this list I read in 2014 than there were before that. Uh, so that's sort of Shauna's impact on diversity. There's also some IT stuff we've sort of changed over the years. So originally we had student organizers uh, organizing their events via a mailing list that was hosted at lists.openhash.org on a mailman instance, which was okay. Uh, but Shauna set up a tool called Discourse, which is an online forum that makes it way easier to see and search those. Uh, she also took a 
event registration tool called Bridge Patrol, made by the Rails Bridge community, which is a gender diversity outreach program originally started in San Francisco for Ruby on Rails, uh, and patched that to be more for Open Hatch. Uh, so this has really helped us stay more organized. And I think it helps organizers see the conversations of other organizers, and that'll help a lot as, uh, as there's less of a center. Um, so another sort of bit of technology that we figured out, remember how I couldn't actually tell who needed help? Um, we started asking people to put red and green sticky notes on their computers if, when, if they needed help. Well, so, uh, so the sticky notes are used for two things. I'm being a bit unclear here. One is that at the end of the day, we can gather feedback by asking people to write a note on a sticky note and give it to us. This has a much better response rate than our lousy email responses. Uh, the other is that if you're doing something and you're stuck, you can put a red sticky note on the back of your computer, and unlike a hand, there's no gravity that causes it to go down. So that'll stay there. Some mentor will wander around and find it. Um, so I have about two minutes in which to try to tell you about the future, so we'll see what I can do. Uh, there's a few unsolved problems for us still. Uh, one isn't something that we need to solve, but it's just a fact of life, which is that volunteers who attend an event aren't necessarily motivated to improve it for the next event, unless they're the ones running the next event. So just a few days ago, a friend of mine in IRC said about a Chicago event he ran, every time I think I should update those shared slides you published, I just don't get around to. And this is one of the maintainers of the GNOME documentation toolkit. Like, he knows about doc the importance of documentation, and this is not a slight on him. It's just a statement that someone else, other than the on-the-ground volunteers, is going to have to be the one. Uh, the other is getting things to compile. So this is Marina working with some students. And um, the one best time that I've seen for getting the community part and the compiling part of open source projects to both work, which are the hard ones for getting people involved on that second half of the day, uh, is Sean Lip. He stood up at the front of the room introducing his project, and he said, hi, my name is Sean. I work on an interactive education toolkit called Opia. If you work with me, I will be responsible for finding the way that you can make a difference in this project. I'm gonna, and then when, uh, so he had that commitment with students, and so like a third of the students went to him, and then he asked them three questions, and he said, what do you like about this project, what do you know, and what do you want to learn? And then he racked his brain to find them a specific task for them, rather than giving them a long list. Uh, and then he emailed them to follow up a week or two later, and about half of the volunteers who he had gotten from that event were still active a month or two later, which, compared to the 10% I'm used to is pretty amazing. Uh, I have about 12 seconds, so I'll close by just saying that we just published a blog post about how we're searching for one more board member. Uh, we'll be searching for a staff member to soon. Um, so I guess that's all. I can take some questions uh, in the passing time. You can visit campus.openhash.org. If you want to support this program with dollars, you can do that. If your company wants to, that's totally even better. We love sponsors, and we will thank you graciously on our website. Uh, you can also volunteer. Campus.openhatch.org tells you how. Uh, thanks so much. Mm -hmm.